Hello, I'm David Legg. In this uh, presentation, I'm going to be talking about development assistance for health. I'll talk a little bit about the history of de development assistance, a bit about the idea. Um, I'll take you through some of the funding pathways and where the money goes and so forth. And then I'll end up with a bit of a discussion about the MDGs and whatever is going to follow the MDGs. And finally, I will ask some questions about development assistance for health. Is it development? Is it assistance? And is it for health? So let's start with history. Um, the term development was used under the under colonial rule. Um, it's an open question as to how it was being used, but certainly part of the justification of the colonial rule was that we are developing the natives. Um, yeah, I don't think this uh, usage has completely disappeared. Colonialism was replaced in a sense by imperialism, or they overlapped, and with imperialism came national liberation in many, many, and decolonization. Um, but, and with decolonization came the post-colonial economic development debates. We, we'll get into this shortly, but the, um, the advocates of colonial independence and national liberation had a very different view of the pathways to economic development than did the previous colonial slash imperial masters. Okay. Coning down a little bit more closely to health, we can come back to primary health care, which was the beginning of an approach to comprehensive um, health system development and clearly an institutional development as part of economic and social development. However, as we've described, the debt crisis um, hit from the 1980s and basically everything went backwards under structural adjustment. And so from that time onwards, the the provision of development assistance, and including development assistance for health, became tied in, in various ways to the, uh, to the uh, work of IMF and World Bank. So what we saw was that the structural adjustment packages initiated by the IMF gradually morphed into poverty reduction strategy packages under the aegis of the World Bank, and swaps were gradually became a more fashionable idea, sector-wide approaches. Uh, this is an early approach to achieving coordination between different, uh, between different donors working across different sectors. So within one country, a sector-wide approach like within health sector, would would expect that different donors would work together uh, and take a, a coordinated approach. Well, of course, this implies a a single um, strategy for the development of the of the health sector in that country, and some kind of agreement about what elements of that strategy will be picked up by which donors. Um, this ha doesn't appear to have worked very widely. And from the um, uh, late 1990s, the aid effectiveness agenda emerged, uh, in particular driven by the OECD. The OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, the Rich Countries Economics Club, um, has had a very influential committee dealing with development called the Development Assistance Committee, or DAC. And the DAC has run a series of conferences over the last uh, decade, um, Rome, Paris, Accra, Busan, 
um, elaborating on an agenda for promoting aid effectiveness and we'll discuss that shortly. The aid effectiveness agenda was clearly a response to the fragmentation of development assistance under SAPs, PRSPs and SWAPs. However, the aid effectiveness agenda was in a sense bypassed by the advent of ARVs and the uh, Global Health Initiatives, GHIs, which emerged in the, in the 2000s to deliver the vertical disease focused programs with which we're now quite familiar. Um, the, uh, an attempt to bring a more coherent, a more comprehensive approach to development assistance is associated with the Millennium Development Goals, which were adopted at the Millennium Summit at the United Nations in the year 2000. And these goals um, have been um, linked to the dramatic increase in development assistance during the 2000s. Um, in some respects, the goals at the MDGs have been treated as if they were themselves responsible for the increase in development assistance, which is a, a proposition which needs to be uh, thought about. As I've described elsewhere, the health system strengthening agenda um, started to emerge in the first decade of, of this century with um, increasing criticism of the fragmenting effect of the vertical disease focused programs and the health system strengthening agenda gradually morphed into um, the slogan of universal health cover as I'll describe universal health cover remains a little bit uh, ambiguous in terms of what it really means and finally as the MDGs wind up because they were designed to um, to finalize in 2015 there's a, a, an active discussion going on within the United Nations about the so-called post 2015 development agenda or the sustainable development agenda sustainable development goals so um, from colonialism to the post 2015 development agenda we we've 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 traveled a fairly crooked path um, I think we need to ask what is development because it's a very very slippery term many people would uh, imagine that development is really about industrialization the acquisition of capital sufficient to buy machinery which makes things and then sell things um, both domestically and overseas so trade would go with that um, alternatively development and, and overlapping that development might be regarded as economic growth um, that if there is an increasing number of transactions recorded then presumably economic development is taking place um, economic growth as measured by the GDP is a very uh, flawed measure of economic development. Um, uh, Amartya Sen has been associated with the view that development should be regarded as freedom and the capacity to choose the way you want to live. Um, development as freedom and if you're hungry and you don't have decent living conditions you can never be free um, in and, and and clearly the there is an overlap between that and economic growth that if, if, if that with freedom uh, freedom is facilitated by having resources um, in the indigenous communities of Latin America and Central America in particular development is treated rather skeptically and instead this concept of bon vivir is being is being talked about a great deal that the bon vivir is about living well 
It's about how well you are living in, in relation to your peers, to your families, communities, and in relation to Mother Earth. Um, insofar as Mother Earth has been badly damaged by a lot of economic development, when Vivir is an attempt to to uh, to bring um, a a more ecological, more human approach to these measures of development. And finally, we might mention inclusion and participation as being um, an element of, of, of development. Because if you establish industries and economic growth, but have a large proportion of the, of the population excluded from such participation, it seems a little unreal to um, to treat this as some kind of uh, progressive progress as in development. Okay, so then let's look on the right hand side of the slide at what I've listed here as some of the resources for development and obviously natural resources such as forests, um, uh, land upon which you can grow stuff, capital, um, trading opportunities, technology, these are these are well known as resources for development, education. We'll come back to health as a resource for development. But let's also look at peace, equality, solidarity, the, the, the relationships between people, culture, institutions, history and traditions as also as resources for development. Okay, I'm not going to, yeah, okay. So this idea of development is, 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 is complicated. Let's come back to it. Um, at the, the, the most fundamental debates about development are about macroeconomics. Maybe not the most fundamental, but pretty basic. Um, there, is, there, has, there have been several schools of thought which claim to know the iron laws of social development. Marx hypothesized that capitalism would give way to socialism, which would give way to communism. Um, and this was his perspective on um, economic development, certainly. The American uh, political scientist, Walt Rostow, um, imagined that the development of, of capitalism in particular countries took the same pathway in each, each, each case, that there was a, a takeoff phase. And once that takeoff phase had taken place, then capitalist development was, was assured. The problem with Marx was that uh, the world is more complex than, than his iron laws. The problem with Rostow Likewise, but in, in addition is the fact that um, we live in a single world and uh, the, the closed nature of the global economy was not, is, not, is not one that w was considered in, in the development of this kind of linear approach to capitalist takeoff. The, in the period of the uh, 50s and 60s, the idea of dependency theory was very strong within the third world and the non-aligned movement. And this was an, affirm, an affirmation of the importance of in infant industry protection, of using tariff measures and, and domestic uh, procurement measures to um, support the development of, of infant industry, to support the technological development, to support employment. Um, this was, um, this ran in parallel with an alternative argument, which was about export oriented development. And of course, in many countries, the, um, the, the, there was some kind of mixture between the two, the dependency that infant in industry protection is not only for domestic consumption. You would hope to be able to gradually start trading um, on, the, on the world market. And so export-oriented development is not the only, uh, is not necessarily inconsistent 
with um, some level of protection. However, the 1970s downturn um, and the rise of neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus um, really killed off dependency theory. Well, not didn't kill the theory, but killed off the um, the sort of con t these two contending uh, debate, the d debate between these two contending theories, because the, uh, the the dominant theory became one of export orientation, and we've seen how the structural adjustment programs imposed by the IMF during the 1980s. Uh, included a very strong orientation towards exporting, uh, so uh, as well as a, a, um, a refusal to accept the use of tariffs to protect infant industries. Um, the the new turn of events in the 2000s, of course, is the emerging economies and uh, the um, the the relatively short period of uh, the US as being the only great power, that's to say after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, the US was the great power for a while and still is of course the most powerful um, of, the, of nation states. But by the um, end of the first decade of this millennium, it's, it's very clear that the so-called emerging economies um, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, but other emerging economies as well, um, have a certain level of autonomy, a certain level of independence and are gradually developing alternative um, uh, economic policies. So nevertheless, the, the, some of the themes that I've touched upon on this slide remain absolutely critical in terms of the um, debates about development. Um, to what extent should um, there be industry protection? To, uh, to what extent can we think of countries in uh, having a, a, an isolated trajectory without regard to the closed nature of the global economy? Let me illustrate this. In the 1980s, one of the advisors advisories that the IMF would give was that you should develop your export economy. And so a lot of countries were encouraged to take up coffee growing to export their coffee. Um, but of course, if, if many countries do the same, then the, the, the supply will, uh, will, will there may, there's a movement to oversupply, the prices that they can get for their coffee will fall. And of course, what happens is that the large transnationals who still control the production of, uh, of instant coffee, Nestle in particular, um, are able to increase the margin that they are making because they don't reduce the price of coffee in the, um, in the, in the, in the developed world. Or maybe they do, I don't know. But I'm just trying to make the point that, that if all the developing countries are told to start growing coffee, then the point of it will, will uh, the price will fall and the point of, of, of trying to build an export oriented development on such a strategy w will be, uh, it may not work. Um, and the point I'm making is that we live in a, in a contained global economy and you can't, you can't have a, a model of development which is just, uh, takes an isolated linear trajectory for separate countries. Likewise, I don't think you can assume that there are autonomous laws which govern the development of the economic development of, of, of countries. This is something which has to be, um, which is struggled for. So the second theme, so there's the, the theme about industry protection versus export orientation on this slide, but also the emergence of neoliberalism and the importance of understanding that and then the emergence of the so-called emerging economies, the BRICS, which further challenges our understanding and uh, prediction of what's going on. Okay, now, I think it's also important to think about the different rationales for development assistance. Um, and I think this touches upon the, um, the uh, 
comments I was making before about the the fact that the word development was used quite commonly under colonialism, which sounds a bit odd at this time, but apparently sounded okay, at least for the colonialists at, during that period. Um, I've listed a number of different arguments or rationales for development assistance, and the the one that I find most attractive is the idea that we do we we offer development assistance as a form of solidarity. That this per, these that my brothers and sisters um, in a human family are needing help, and and we all hope that we would reach out to our brothers and sisters when they need help. Um, Another approach is to see it simply in terms of a human of human rights, and sometimes the human rights are treated as somehow a, a, a standalone um, sort of construct outside human choice, human agency. But of course, human rights have always been fought for. Uh, they they reflect a standard which has been achieved, but a standard generally achieved in conflict, in 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 struggle. Um, then there's development assistance as charity, um, which it, it overlaps clearly the idea of solidarity, but it's it's got some significant differences. Um, that my sense of myself as a good person is as important to the uh, charitable donor, perhaps. Um, maybe that's the difference I'm suggesting between solidarity and charity. Um, charity may may not be as sensitive to um, to your perception of what you need than as than solidarity would be and the concept of solidarity does suggest that we're that we're sensitive to what our brothers and sisters see as their needs rather than knowing what is right for them and then we start getting down to some more um, questionable rationales health security is one that the you, that your illness is my risk. Therefore, I will donate money to support uh, to achieve greater health security um, because of my my being at risk. And it's you can see how um, advocates of development assistance would sometimes try and use this argument to persuade um, the rich world donors to give more money. Um, that if you don't strengthen the um, the health security capacity of third world countries, then you are also at risk of AIDS, HIV, or um, SARS, or uh, avian flu, or Ebola, even. Um, but it's it's we're getting further and further away from solidarity when we say that we're going to give you development assistance because of our, um, uh, in order to make our lives more secure. Um, the productivity argument is has been widely used as a justification for development assistance. And this was a very strong argument in the um, World Bank's 1993 report, uh, Investing in Health, that health is a um, resource for production uh, healthy workforce is more productive, and certainly this is true in relation to AIDS HIV, where if you have got a population with a significant number of people who are unwell, and you bring in ARVs so that they can live healthy and productive lives, you will have an this will have an impact on on the on the workforce and on economic development. However. The implication of using productivity as a justification for development assistance is that certain lives are more valuable than others. So uh, um, frail elderly don't uh, are not going to become productive, and so perhaps we don't worry about development assistance for them if the logic of what we're doing is productivity. Um, then moving to the right-hand column, we're getting m more and more <laughs> questionable. Uh, legitimation as a justification for development assistance. This has undoubtedly been a significant driver. Your poor health is an embarrassment to my regime. Therefore, I need to make a contribution to uh, resolving your health. And clearly, 
the um, existence of millions of people with HIV but unable to access medicines because of the high prices supported by the intellectual property regime of the WTO was an embarrassment which contributed to the dramatic increase in development assistance over the first decade of this century. Political control, your anger, my political risk, um, might be illustrated by the decision of, uh, of Bismarck to uh, introduce social insurance in 1883. Um, an the, the, the proletariat was unstable, were angry, they were living in, in, in really dreadful circumstances and diff very difficult working circumstance. So he says, well, let's introduce, um, uh, let's make access to health care uh, more, uh, more f affordable by forcing the, um, the uh, employers to contribute. Um, it's... It's, um, it was effective, it achieved a prog progressive change, but um, it's not really to be, it, it, the level of solidarity is not strong. Um, economic opening up, creating an environment conducive to foreign investment and global uh, economic integration. A lot of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the conquering of yellow fever in the construction of the Panama Canal, the uh, overcoming of the mosquito, um, the learning about how to uh, defend human workers against uh, mosquito-borne disease, um, these were major uh, drivers in, in economic opening up during, during that time, in the late 19th century, in the construction of the Suez Canal. Uh, the Panama Canal. So uh, it's an illustration that, that investment in development assistance may not be entirely based on uh, on the needs of the people that you you're working with. And then finally, covert assistance to domestic interests. I think, or so-called boomerang aid, where the uh, aid is uh, so-called is actually. Um, aid to uh, corporate or or other interests domestically um, that it appears to go overseas but actually comes back. So that's so if you if um, the Australian foreign uh, foreign affairs and trade gives money to a development assistance contractor to deliver programs overseas. If everybody if everyone doing the work are Australians, they take all their salaries home. A relatively small amount of that remains. Um, Japan has been criticised for this sort of boomerang aid because of their, their willingness to pay for equipment which is purchased from Japan, um, which means that the, that the value actually goes to the corporation selling the equipment. Okay, so uh, let's be, let's be sceptical when we look at development assistance and think about the politics of it and what is going on, what, what are the drivers of, of development assistance at any particular time. I've said several times about the, this big increase in, um, in development assistance in the first decade of this century and we've, we've got this sketched on this, uh, on this graph. The orange um, line um, traces total development assistance um, as, as, as recorded by the Development Assistance Committee of uh, the OECD. And this shows that uh, from 1960-56, under the Vietnam War, it was relatively low. There was a, um, a small peak, or it started to accelerate at the end of the 1970s, um, with the debt crisis coming in at, uh, let's say, 1980 and a progressive increase um, through to 1993, um, after which there was a, uh, a, a plateauing, maybe even a, a falling off during the 1990s. Um, but then this dramatic um, escalation in aid from the year 2000 through to the present, um, although probably it has, um, sub it, it may have plateaued off again. So um, what we're looking at at the beginning of this escalation of aid flows 
is the MDGs in the year 2000 and the Treatment Action Campaign and the 9-11 atrocity and in 2001. And it's, a, it's a, an open question as to ask whether it was the MDGs which drove this increase or it was some kind of reaction to, uh, to the debates over treatment access. Uh, okay. Now, on this slide, I've simply listed uh, some of the um, um, uh, websites that can be quite useful. To, so let's go to this website uh, on the DAC uh, web pages. This is Compare Your Country, um, giving, looking at uh, um, the DAC total 1960 to 2013, official development by different countries, um, the development assistance as a percent of GDP or GNP. You remember there's, a, there's been a commitment to, develop, to get development assistance to 0.7% of GDP. Quite clearly, it hasn't happened in the OECD countries. The closest it ever came was in 1961, and since then it's fallen. So as in 2013, the development assistance total was 0.3% of GDP. And then looking at the, the total volumes, um, US uh, a progressive increase, as we've said, through to, 1930, to 2013, a total volume. Um, on this website, which you can f study you know, by yourself, the, uh, we can look at Australia, for example. And what we find is that Australia's ODA um, has remained um, basically uh, unchanged at two thousand after correcting for exchange rates and prices, um, and has in fact fallen as a proportion of GDP across this, this period from a peak of, um, of 0.62 at this time, or a peak here of 0.65, almost got to 0.7 in the in 1970s under, uh, under Whitlam. Um, but this is where we are now. Okay, or alternatively, we can look at the US and um, follow, now the US is, is a major contributor to uh, global uh, development assistance, but when you express it as a proportion of GDP, it's it remains well. It was high in the 19 um, in the 1960s at 0.6, but has remained quite low, let's say, from the 1970s through to the present. And I think it's worth saying that a lot of the aid which is um, uh, which is counted as aid but for both Australia and the United States, is about aiding the countries where we have invaded. Okay, now let's go back to my presentation and look at aid, this, this um, um, website, which invites you to look at uh, the gross disbursements of aids aid by donors, so the size of the, um, of the bubble is how much is being given, um, and the, uh, or is it the colour of the bubble? So, it's, so um, we can look at the donor by clicking on the country, or we can go to recipient view and look at the uh, at the recipients or oh, this link is broken sorry so click on so the bubble size represents the total volume of, of de development assistance the bubble color is the ratio of development assistance to gross uh, domestic product so the total size of the US is biggest bigger than anybody else but uh, the color in terms of uh, development assistance is, is relatively is, is very relatively light. Looking at the legend here, um, the colour is is um, you know, not up to that one percent. And you can see that the the colour of the Nordic countries over here um, is is much higher. Okay, so let's go back to my presentation 
and finally look at this website for aid flows. Um, the, uh, the value of this website is that it includes not just the DAC countries but also the multilateral organisations such as the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank and so forth. So um, we can look at, at uh, the donors, uh, and this, this is going down the left, we can look at the donors as countries or the donors as multilateral institutions. So that's looking at the Nordic Development Fund. You can look at the, uh, oh, no data, I'm sorry. Let's look at the uh, IBRD, the World Bank. And you can see the, uh, the contributions by different countries, um, the contributions to, to aid, and the, uh, and the uh, where the money goes. Okay, and then you can look at beneficiaries, or you can look at in specific institutions. Um, Okay, this is a, a website that perhaps you could explore at your leisure in due course. Um, this is a diagram, a notional diagram about how some aid flows. Um, and uh, just to say that there is an institutional structure through which aid is delivered. And it's important to uh, keep in mind that the, because each of the elements on this page have got their own bureaucratic interests and their, their own um, barriers and uh, um, log jams and so forth. So let's say the taxpayers make a, a contribution in tax to the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance passes it on to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or to the aid agency. The aid agency may set up a framework agreement with the Ministry of Finance of the recipient country and then the aid will flow to a contractor. Under that aid program, the contractor will do the design work and then will do the implementation work for the project. That will involve a project manager and technical staff. Uh, the Ministry of Finance of the recipient country will be watching what's happening and will be asking, can we have some more um, local people employed, please? Can we do it in a slightly different way, please? Um, in many cases, the Ministry of Finance pays relatively large program grants to NGOs uh, to, to deliver aid. And of course, the NGOs have their own uh, revenue sources in terms of donations and shops and so forth. Um, the uh, the Ministry of Finance will, as part of its aid budget, will also give grants to the multilaterals, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, the, um, the Global Health Initiatives, and they will um, pass money to the recipient countries, maybe to the Ministry of Finance, or maybe they will deliver their programs directly. The World Bank typically does large projects which would be funded uh, by a grant to the, um, or a loan to the Minister of Finance to, to pay for a large infrastructure pro project. So um, it's important to, to follow through the, uh, the, the institutional structures through which aid is delivered. On this slide, I've, I've uh, taken a few diagrams from the Development Assistance World, including the, the process of programs and projects, program development, programming, identifying needs, formulating strategies, implementing, evaluating. Project design, which might, which is conceived as going from initiation to planning and design, execution, monitoring and closing. It's all very, it's all very nice. And the, uh, back to this, the log, uh, log logical framework, uh, log frames which show how resources lead to activities, lead to processes or outputs, lead to act further activities, lead to final outputs, lead to outcomes, lead to impact. And uh, the, uh, 
the usefulness of this kind of diagram is to insist on monitoring and evaluating um, all of these elements so you can see what is working and what's what's not working and it's all terribly logical um, let's take Oxfam Australia as an example the these uh, purposes and descriptions of its work are taken from its website Oxfam saves lives before during and after the humanitarian crisis it works locally with people and communities to support their development and influence policies and practices that will reduce poverty and it seeks to influence governments institutions and businesses to implement laws policies and practices that will help people to rise out of poverty Oxfam campaigns for change and still I'm quoting from their website works with local organizations to build capacity supports women and First Nations people brokers mobilizes and participates in networks that influence governments corporations to bring out system sustainable and systemic change brings together organizations that represent poor people with relevant go governments corporations so they can discuss problems safely with dignity and work collaboratively to identify ways of redressing the imbalance of power Oxfam undoubtedly is one of the very best of the NGOs in this field this is a further diagram illustrating the uh, areas where Oxfam works in Africa and Latin America and particularly in uh, in uh, Asia um, this is a statement of consolidated income for Oxfam Australia for the financial year 2013 um, I'd ask you to focus on the consolidated uh, revenue for um, uh, for 2013 and perhaps I could just ask you to look at that for a moment and see what you think about the, um, the, um, the what you're seeing here okay the, the, the points I'd like to highlight are that the, that the the very significant proportion of Oxfam's total expenditure or total income of 82 million is coming from grants from government and non-government sources so it is Oxfam is a recipient um, however it still is the case that a larger proportion of its income is coming from community donations and from the sale of goods at the Oxfam shops and Oxfam uh, fair trade uh, sales the fundraising expenses uh, of for this level of 42 million are around 9 million which is looks pretty good to me but administration costs are quite high at, at 16 million as well although much smaller than the total expenditure on, on program costs the significance of um, of these figures about Oxfam's consolidated income for me is that it depends upon its dependence upon government grants and on donations from the in this case the Australian community is in, in a sense a restriction on the capacity of the organization to take a radical position in relation to the, um, uh, the, the, the dynamics the structures the forces which reproduce poverty Oxfam as I've said is, is one of the absolute best in the NGOs and does take a very strong position on a number of issues but its position is still limited by its dependence on government and on the sentiment of progressive um, sectors of the Australian community if it alienated these sectors too much it would lose money so the point I'm making is that let's keep in mind that the development assistance organizations are part of the uh, the culture the institutional norms the expectations of the countries from which they come 
Okay, let's move away from then to the, the bigger picture of the, the development institutions generally. And on this slide, I've just listed some of the big ones. And I have um, hyperlinked, and you can go to the, uh, to the PDF version of this lecture and you know, click on these hyperlinks and follow them to, to the different groups. The World Bank is actually a group of five um, separate organisations which have different functions and I would urge you to um, investigate and learn about those different functions. The WDR stands for World Development Reports which is an annual report produced by the World Bank which are always worth reading, not necessarily that you would follow their recommendations in every case. Okay, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, um, worth a visit. Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. This has been very strongly supported by the Gates Foundation. USAID, which makes no secret of the fact that it uh, delivers aid in order to further the interests of the United States. PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief is one of the biggest donors for AIDS and a huge donor. Um, the PEPFAR is restricted by Act of Congress to, uh, in, in respect of its, its, its collaboration with other agencies. And so when you look at the, these ideas about um, swaps, sector-wide approaches and collaboration of that sort, PEPFAR is quite restricted in the degree to which you can do that. DFID is the DFIAD, the Department for International Development of the United Kingdom, is a major donor. The UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, is, uh, is the United Nations body which is uh, specialises in so-called development and the the discussion within UNDP about the meaning of development is, is a very interesting and useful discussion. UNDP produces uh, the annual Human Development Report and these are listed here and they are worth definitely worth a visit. And then as I've said the OECD, the Organisation for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development is the Rich Countries Club and the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD is the perhaps the most senior um, international organisation which brings together donors, um, including the multilateral donors, uh, to reflect upon their policies. Okay, so um, on this slide I've just listed some of the unintended consequences um, of development assistance which need to be kept in mind. Um, corruption is undoubtedly an important one and some of the uh, yeah and there's been some good cases of this, bad cases of this. Dictatorship there have been when, when it suits the large powers to support dictators using development assistance funding this has been uh, there's been no shortage of such funding De creating dependency through development assistance is, is an issue, the weakening of sovereignty and, and democratic governance and the problem of institutional distortion being uh, vertical fragmentation and brain drain and I'll talk about a few of these. Um, on this slide I've listed external resources for health as a proportion of total health expenditure um, and if you just follow through the, um, let's start with Australia, which has a per capita total health expenditure in international dollars in 2011 of $3,890 international dollars. That's up uh, from over the year 2000 from $2,200. And the proportion of total ex health expenditure, which is based on external resources for health, is um, zero. Uh, same for the US which now spends $8,000 per head on health and the proportion of that coming from development assistance is zero. 
But if we look at the low income group of countries, the total health expenditure per capita has increased dramatically, you could say, doubled from 28 to 64 over this period. Total per capita, total health expenditure. But external resources for health have also almost have also doubled from 14% of total health expenditure to 29% of total health expenditure. And in some countries, external resources for health are greater than 50%, as in Eritrea at 71%, Ethiopia at 51%, Gambia 62%, Haiti 86%, Mozambique 72%, and Malawi 56%. The point I'm wanting to make on this slide is that if your um, external resources for health are so, as significant as these are, up to 30%, 50%, 40%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%,
the this is a document which is is really well worth reading but what it's essentially saying is why aren't we examining the conditions under which all these other outflowing monies are pa being paid in particular um, tax evasion and illicit financial flows through tax havens why aren't we examining the the circumstances of those outflows um, rather than focusing only on the development assistance is it the case that in some degree this development assistance so called is instead of focusing on the conditions under which these outflows take place There's, that's that's a, an issue for you to reflect on and perhaps go and visit this particular report and see what you think um, this is uh, also taken from the same document um, listing the inflows in official development assistance to the OECD, private grants, loans, etc. Um, a total of 133 as opposed to the outflows, which is a total of 191. This is worth, uh, and, and in particular, I highlight debt repayments, um, illicit financial outflows, etc. So, and under these circumstances, the, 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 the continued criticisms and the continued unsatisfactory nature of, of, of aid, the aid effectiveness agenda emerged. And uh, this emerged at the, uh, in a, it has, has been elaborated and developed in a series of uh, conferences organised through the OECD's Development Assistance Committee. Uh, including the conference in Rome, in Paris, in Accra, and most recently, Busan, Korea. And the broad themes which are developed, which, which constitute the aid effectiveness agenda are five, and these are about ownership, that the recipient country should own the programs, should have a sense of ownership of the programs being funded, alignment, which is about the alignment between the purposes of the donors and the purposes of the country. Harmonisation, which is about harmonising the, the purposes and procedures of the different donors operating in a particular country. Managing for results, which is about ensuring that you're monitoring and evaluating what you're doing. When I say you, let's be clear that we're talking about the donors managing their own expenditures for results. It's, it's, it's a, again raises questions about sovereignty. And then mutual accountability, that the government should be accountable to the donors, and the donors should be accountable to the government, although the donors are giving money and the countries are receiving money. So the aid effectiveness agenda is, is, has made, undoubtedly has contributed to um, uh, tighter administration, more effective administration of aid, but it hasn't changed, it hasn't really altered some of the fundamental problematics of development assistance. The current priorities for development assistance for health, um, as administered through the range of, um, of global health initiatives, of global public-private partnerships, which have been the main vehicles through which development assistance for health has been delivered over the last 10, 15 years, are uh, AIDS and HIV for diagnosis and treatment, tuberculosis, case finding and treatment, malaria, with a big focus on both diagnosis and insecticide-treated bed nets and treatment, vaccine development and delivery, and some expenditure on water and sanitation. These have been supported, or along with these, have been the Millennium Development Goals adopted in December 2000, uh, of which there are eight. Um, number f and f four of these have particular relevance to, uh, to uh, health. So number four is about reducing child mortality. And what we can see is the green, these data are taken from the annual report from the UN on the achievements of the, um, of the uh, um, development assistance of the MDGs. So in sub-Saharan Africa, the goal to reduce 
um, under fives mortality between on the basis of the 1990 figure of 198 was to achieve it down to this level. Actually, what they've got down to is 98 per thousand live births. In Southern Asia, they still haven't achieved the, the 2015 goal. In Oceania, we haven't achieved the goal. Neither we have we in these countries. We, we're, in North Africa, however, the, the goal has been achieved, down from 73 in 1990 to 22. And the goal's almost been achieved in Latin America and the Caribbean. It has been achieved in East Asia. So um, the, um, the, the target uh, for the developed regions was, was what, five, and it's, uh, we're still a little bit above that. So, the, however, the numbers remain very, very high, um, and um, uh, as, well as, the, as well as the ratios. Maternal mortality, um, the goal was to reduce maternal mortality to this, to this level from the 1990 figure, and as you can see, it hasn't been achieved in sub-Saharan Africa or in Southern Asia or in Oceania, or Caribbean, or uh, Latin America. It has almost been achieved in East Asia. Um, combating um, AIDS, HIV, malaria, and other diseases, this was MDG6. Um, it, it would appear that this trend on tuberculosis, the estimated number of deaths due to tuberculosis, excluding people who are HIV positive, is closely trending towards the, um, the target, but um, this is, is not the case in, uh, in uh, all of the, these areas. I'll, I'll leave you to have a look at this um, slide on the PDF version of the presentation. Um, ensure, number seven is to ensure environmental sustainability and uh, Let's focus first of all on the bottom left hand corner which deals with sanitation and this is the number of people who are living in particular um, uh, sanitation regimes and what we can see is that there remains a billion people um, who are forced to continue to practice open, open defecation uh, a further point, a further 800 million people who have what is quoted as unimproved sanitation practices, um, but there has been uh, an increase in the number of people with improved sanitation. Now, whether you regard this as a success or a failure, um, to come from 1.3 to 1.0 over a 20-year period, um, I'll, I'll invite you to, to, to choose. Um, the proportion of populations using an improved drinking water source it looks good when you look at look at it in terms of percentages that the targets appear to have been achieved but we are still looking at a large number of people who are um, so look at this brown uh, part of the bar people who are having to cope with improved but fecally contaminated water sources for their drinking water. Um, and then this last one down here is about the proportion of people living in slums. Okay, so the, there's a couple of things to be said about the MDGs. <clears throat> one is to ask whether it was the MDGs which drove the increased um, development assistance or whether the MDGs were constructed in order to measure what was what was already um, in train in terms of increased development assistance. This is a discussion that we can have later on perhaps. Um, at the moment there's a lot of discussion being going on within the UN about the post MDGs so called and there are basically two processes going on within the UN system um, which have yet to come together one is the post 2015 development agenda and the other is the post Rio 
sustainable development goals. Um, if, let's start by looking at the post-MDG's development agenda. And um, uh, this has been a sequence of meetings of various groups discussing uh, what should come after the MDGs, the high-level plenary meeting of the UN General Assembly, the high-level panel of eminent persons, the thematic paper on health, the global thematic consultation. A million voices, the world we want. Now, I think we can say that the, um, that the development of the post-MDG targets or goals has been much, much more consultative than was the development of the MDGs themselves. And this is undoubtedly good. And that's, but there is a but, but we'll come to it in a minute. This is the result of the My World survey results, asking people what they would vote for <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, the uh, goals uh, for the post-MDGs. And uh, what we find is that education and healthcare come up well ahead. Honest, responsible government comes up well. Um, action on climate change is a little disappointing coming after phone and internet access. Um, and political freedoms is relatively low, which is quite interesting. Okay. So that's one, so this is, this is the second stream of work, which followed the 1992 um, uh, Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio. And then in, in 2012, the Rio Plus 20, Conference on Sustainable Development was held. Um, and this has been characterised by the uh, uh, UN General Assembly resolution on the future we want, the high level political forum, the open working groups, a meeting on SDGs, um, and the UN Secretary General's action agenda for sustainable development. So these complicated processes going on in the UN. <clears throat> have yet to come together, but uh, they will. This is, these are the, uh, the goals which have come up through the Sustainable Solutions Network, which is part of the sustainable, uh, ecological sustainability development agenda. End extreme poverty and hunger, achieve development and prosperity for all, ensure learning, gender equality, health and well-being at all ages, increase agricultural production, make the cities more productive, curb human-induced climate change, etc. improve government-aligned business behaviour with all the goals. And the Open Working Group in July 2014 came up with these 11 goals. End poverty or all its forms everywhere. End hunger. Healthy lives for all, inclusive equitable education, gender equality, sustainable management of water and sanitation. These are very, very good. Uh, modern energy for all, sustained, inclusive, sustainable economic growth, full productive employment, decent work for all, reduce inequality, make cities and human settlements inclusive and safe. And there will be a meeting in September 2015 at which the, uh, these two streams of work will be integrated and the post-2015 UN development agenda will be adopted. It's pretty important, in my view, to think about, as, and I've raised this already, did the MDGs drive the increase in development assistance, or were they constructed in order to um, rationalise um, a flow of aid which was already on the way? And uh, it's, it's obviously there's no open and shut yes or no answer. The MDGs may have helped to direct some of the aid and many governments clearly gave increased attention to some of the goals as a consequence of them being adopted and being the results being published. But um, there are other global processes going on as the, um, the Health Poverty Action um, thing about Africa that I talked about a little while ago show other, other processes going on that are running in the opposite direction and are not being arrested by things like MDGs or post-MDGs. 
So my next question is why the complex and bureaucratic diplomatic processes around the post 2015 goals? And I guess I want to put on the table that in part, this is about advocates pushing for, in our case, health, pushing for health to be, to be considered um, the WHO, in particular the Director General of WHO, Dr Chan, has pushed universal health cover very strongly in the post-2015 UN debates. Um, there's been also some defensive advocacy going on, so the food industry is making sure that, that nothing is adopted that uh, suggests that uh, uh, the regulation of transnational food companies. Um, and there is also a certain bureaucratic interest um, of the various bureaucracies participating in this um, fairly complicated process, and their interest is clearly in accessing the aid flows. So um, a little bit of scepticism, even cynicism, might not be a bad thing in terms of thinking through um, how... Uh, where is the drive for the production of these goals if indeed there, is, there are questions to be asked about the degree to which goals drive progress? Okay, so in summary, some of the major items on the global policy agenda with respect to development assistance. Um, first of all, the post-MDGs. Um, and we need to have an opinion about those. Secondly, the ongoing development aid effectiveness agenda and the uh, coordination of development assistance for health. Thirdly, the role of global health initiatives in development assistance. Given the health system's impact of these vertical disease-focused programs, vertical fragmentation, internal brain drain, uh, a reporting burden, and to what extent can we expect um, development assistance to drive health systems strengthening? Um, fifthly, tax avoidance, capital flight and theft versus development assistance. At, at the same time as the UN is debating um, a new post-2015 development agenda, the same country, the leading uh, OECD countries, are discussing the development of a new trading a trade agreement called TISA, uh, Trade in Services Agreement, which will make it harder to control the financial sector globally, which will make it harder to clamp down on tax avoidance and capital flight. So number six has to be global economic policies for development. And in this, under this heading, the big debate is between, let's say, the Washington consensus um, for export-oriented, competitive, market-based economic development versus the, let's go back to the new international economic order of 1964, which remains, uh, continues to have some useful ideas in it. But I'm, I'm, I'm taking these two agendas, these two economic policy frameworks, um, as highlighting the continued debate over global economic policies for development. And in that heading, we could recall that the, at the Doha meeting of the uh, Ministerial Council of the World Trade Organization in 2001, there was a commitment to open a, a program of, nego of, of uh, negotiations for development the so-called Doha Development Round, to, re, to reshape the trading regime globally to promote development, and that Doha Development Round has gone nowhere. So what's the place of development assistance? Is it a barrier to development? Probably not. Maybe in some respects. It's really, uh, at a big picture, probably a bit difficult to say, but we need to keep in mind that sometimes it might be. So, how shall we start to work through these issues? What, where will we start our discussion? What is development? Um, what do you think is the, the use of this term? And does development assistance assist in development? 
what are the different rationales for development assistance and what do you think about them? How do they reflect differently in practice? How do these different rationales for development assistance shape the delivery and uh, policies around development assistance? What were the main pressures behind the increase in development assistance in the 2000s? Do you think that the, uh, as I've said here, the strength of Oxfam in, is its status in Australia as a recipient of donations? Is this a limitation also? In what ways? And how will the SDGs drive sustainable development? Will the SDGs drive sustainable development? So I'm really looking forward to discussing these issues with you. And in the meantime, I, uh, I hope you find um, interest in the uh, references that uh, I've, uh, I've linked and the materials on our slides. Thanks very much.